two, three, going live. Hello and welcome to session three of Really, the uh, theory workshop that uh, we are hosting for on behalf of, of Inclusive Futures. This is uh, the core team here is uh, uh, Sanford Quinta, uh, myself, Neil Leach, uh, Victoria Luis Barbo, and Marina Rodriguez Das Neves. And the idea here is that we each day we invite um, different guests in to pose a series of, que series of questions in a sense to provoke a discussion uh, and we'll take it on from there. Today, I should say that we have to finish after in, in by, by, by 10.2, so we only have an hour and, and three quarters um, in order to make space for the next one. Um, I want to hand it over now to Sanford Quinter, who is the, the host for today's session. Sanford. Well, hey, thank you very much. So yes, I'll tell uh, our, our guests, of course, and our, um, our uh, attendees that uh, we should keep in mind that we have a hard uh, stop at 11.50, um, so let's uh, keep it as, shall we say, as provocative and as dense as possible uh, in the first half so that we can flesh out um, as much uh, spontaneous uh, discussion and questions perhaps uh, from the audience afterward. Now, um, the topic, uh, could we read out, could you read, uh, Neil, would you mind reading out the exact title of today's uh, event. And um, what I'm going to do, just so everyone knows, is then I'm going to ask Bruce Mao within a, in, in under a minute to explain to us exactly where uh, that uh, the inspiration for that title came. Then we will hand it over to David Fortin. But I will say a couple of things right after that. I'll save my intro uh, for that. So Neil, what is the exact title? The exact title is, You Can't Do That, Dad, uh, said the millennial to the boomer. First Meditations on Indigenous Cosmologies, Urgent Knowledge and Humility. Now, Bruce, if you don't mind, could you just explain to the audience what the, um, yeah, what the context is, especially for the first part of the, uh, of the title? Uh, so I've been working with David and the folks at um, McEwen School of Architecture in my hometown for uh, several years now, and I became more and more interested um, in uh, an indigenous cosmology and an indigenous way of, of thinking about life um, that was very different than the way that um, that you know I grew up, let's say. And um, as part of that process, uh, I had conversations with uh, David Fortin and. And uh, and a friend and a friend of his that he put me on to, and uh, we talked about a, a, attending a powwow, um, which I was very excited about. And I came home. Well, I was home. <laughs> I, I went to <laughs> I went to the dinner table, uh, and I was talking to my daughters about this idea that actually I was very excited when the pandemic subsides that I would um, you know really uh, get to attend a powwow. And they said, oh, no, no, dad, you, you can't do that. <laughs> and I said, well, what do you mean I can't do that? And they said, uh, no, it's, it's really, you know, it's not right. Um, you really shouldn't do that. And I said, well, you know, actually, David suggests that I do it. Um, and I thought it was very interesting that they <clears throat> had such a strong reaction. Um, and really underlying it was, you know, in my case, uh, a very sincere ambition to learn that I'm interested in learning. Um, and, but you can see how kind of hot the subject is, uh, that their initial reaction would be, don't, don't even think about it. Um, so that's sort of how we got there. Well, let me add to that. So first of all, um, there are, complications, shall we say, um, because of what one might call a, an excess of vigilance and gateways um, in the way, shall we say, of the free engagement happening today or the free engagements possible today with the cultural um, inheritances and assets of 
let's just say other cultures and particularly in today's context, which we could say of colonized cultures, which problematizes in many ways, or at least throws up a lot of, uh, shall we say, just complexities. I'm going to leave it at that in the way of those wishing to establish relations with, I'm going to use Bruce's word again, cosmologies. It was also a word that we carried over into the title, the second half of the title. And I want to say that Bruce and I have been doing some conversations here, there, uh, and everywhere uh, in Zoom and other places. And Bruce has just published a book in which he relates some of the impact that his engagement and contact with, uh, with hybrid and indigenous ways in Canada have informed in very critical ways his practice. I would only say this is that those types of engagements have always been incredibly important to me as well. Aware of these complications, um, we wanted to find a way to create an invitation for ourselves, which was never formally given, if such an invitation is proper and forthcoming. And that's where we uh, became very interested in engaging with David Fortin, uh, uh, from Canada, who will, uh, who is, in fact, I think he calls himself a Métis, uh, and that term, I think, will become a topic of conversation today, but it means certainly that he is at least partly, um, shall we say, Indigenous, and uh, has incorporated, if you like, those cosmologies in many ways into his own thinking. Uh, in my past conversations with him, I, I've just found them electrifying. And um, I, I, we're both here, Bruce and me and everyone else, with a real openness. Um, and, um, and, and I have to say the third word, humility, uh, as we engage this. Now, I would also like to introduce Sean Connolly, who uh, is uh, from Hawaii, who happens to be in New York at the very moment, has joined us from New York City, where he is now teaching and engaged in his, at least his third engagement at Ivy League universities, where he has uh, incorporating into his pedagogy um, aspects and many aspects of his um, interests in indigenous uh, philosophy and culture, especially in the Hawaiian context, we don't know where it's going to go, but I just wanted to say this for the audience, is that um, uh, we are bringing a certain defiance to the table here, but openness as well. We are interested to hear, is, we're interested to come to discovering a way of engagement that I hope will have no real boundaries, but we'll see what comes up. I'd like to uh, ask anyone else who'd like to say anything introductory before um, I turn it over to David. All right, David, please welcome. Thank you for being here. And uh, if you like, please begin. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Tansei, everybody. Um, I just want to say uh, it's a real honor to be invited by uh, Sanford and Bruce and and people like Neil Leach and uh, and uh, you you guys are all people that I've been reading for many years and so I just want to say it's an honor and and, and I'm happy to be here. Uh, I also want to acknowledge I'm calling in today from the traditional territories of the Atikamekw Shing Anishinaabek peoples in northern Ontario and that the city is also home to the Wenapate First Nation. And, uh, and I just want to, you know, I wasn't really sure, I didn't want to present a, a lecture by, in, by any means, but what I've done is just put together some slides here um, to kind of set the stage, uh, because I think visually it will help you understand some of the things that we've been pursuing here uh, at the school. And this first image is just, uh, this is my design studio. And so this gives you a hint at uh, a different way of thinking about design, I think. Uh, this is us at Botswana First Nation. Uh, Ojibwe community and the theme of this studio was for the students to listen. Uh, the whole studio theme was on how we listen and how we uh, respect and honor Indigenous people's teachings um, and how we translate that through design work. 
Uh, I was also developing a course early on when I first came here to this school, uh, and uh, for the course is called Design for Climate Change. And uh, I came across this quote from, from the former dean of the School of Forestry. Many of you may have seen this, but I think it's important to set the tone. He said, I used to think that to the top global environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought that with 30 years of good science, we could address these problems, but I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with these, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. Uh, and it just seemed to align with many of the things that I had been researching and thinking about for a number of years. Um, I thought, you know, this is uh, an interesting essay, and I'm going to read it for you, particularly to this question that uh, Bruce and, and Sanford have, have, have offered. Uh, this is a, an essay written by a, a, a member of the Douglas First Nation in British Columbia and teacher at University of Victoria. Uh, and, and it's a protocol for passengers. And I'm just going to read it. I'm going to butcher the pronunciation on, on a lot of the words, but I think it's, it's a really uh, appropriate uh, response. So it says, Amaskit nilsten squatist niskox. Welcome to the sound of running water, idiomorphic orthographies. Welcome to conversations of stone, river, earth, sky. This canoe, sikox, missing a few glottal stops, welcomes you. First, the caution, even to the best swimmers, treaders, floaters, log holders, it would be advisable that while we are in motion that you do not stand up as we journey to lake, stream, river, ocean, sky, stars, language, spirit world. Please spare us. I can hear an academic geyser spouting up right down center, everywhere in particular, this oracle source infected with ratiococcus iris, this mesoscopic cog, nocento of how it education is supposed to be shaped and shaping this disease which is its own vector, this malady which is its own cause, is known to cause short-sightedness, tunnel vision, and intolerance to diffracted white light. Please, speaks the voice from the plume, channel your romantic piffle elsewhere in this country. We use scientific principles, social science methods, including scholarly referencing, which appeared to a succession of mostly white, mostly expired, mostly men of mediated merit, du club de vieux garçons. So this kind of writing, uh, I, I think uh, this essay is quite interesting ab about how we engage with Indigenous topics and some of the complexities about it. And a good colleague and friend of mine, Dr. Patrick Stewart, a Niska architect, wrote an entire PhD with no punctuation uh, because he sees the, the, the language, the structure of language as one of the primary colonizing tools, um, and not everyone loved it. Um, just, you know, this is a definition, uh, thinking about when we talk about critical thinking and critical design, uh, this just comes from the Stanford Encyclopedia, but what's cr crucial here is that it says a theory is critical to the extent that it seeks human emancipation to liberate humans from the very circumstances that enslave them. Well, for many Indigenous peoples, um, and I throw up a personal slide for this reason, this is my family, my dad's family, uh, and to emancipate oneself uh, from your context would be not speaking uh, with respect of your elders and your ancestors, which are crucial for indigenous peoples. So, you know, what gives me a voice to even talk to you all today about this topic is the fact of my grandmother, you know, I give tribute to my grandmother, my dad, my uncles, my aunts, uh, my ancestors before and after. Uh, and, and this is crucial to one's, I think, uh, awareness of oneself in the world. And as I kind of matured as an architect, and before I came here, I was already asking some of these questions. Of, I grew up in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, in northern Saskatchewan. I kept always thinking to myself, what, you know, as I started to realize this, why, why, who thought that this was a good idea, that we should design these buildings in northern Saskatchewan? And, and then I, you know, and then I for a second thought, well, you know, that's historical. That's, that's an old way of treating architecture. But then I kind of, the more I thought about it again, it's like, well, but Snowetta has done a library in Calgary and Foster's working in Canada. And really the style has changed, but the attitudes probably haven't progressed that much actually in terms of place-based respect for how we design and engage in places. And this to me links with other things and I'm not going into this too much detail, but I like that, it, you know, this is a book I like a lot and, and I've met Jeremy too a few times. I like that they, uh, they, that they use this word spatial intelligence in their book that spatial agency requires acute spatial intelligence. And I guess the provocation today and is to think about what, what is 
acute spatial intelligence and how does one acquire acute spatial intelligence because the implication is that we learn that in architecture school or you know through a very kind of rigid and very colonial uh, way of thinking so just as some insights uh, this is a studio i taught a couple of years ago that i titled the architecture of the great connector and the great connector being water and i'm not going to go into this studio in very much detail other than to say that the whole idea for this studio was based on a vision of an elder named Marcel Abel who we work with in our school, Métis elder, Algonquin Métis. And, uh, and we studied this uh, traditional trade route between present-day Ottawa, the, the Sacred Falls uh, in, in Ottawa, and the Gulf of Mexico. And the red blot the blotches that you see there are the current reserves in, in, on Turtle Island. Uh, and the different language groups. And so understanding water as, as a tool to connect us really biologically, but also um, conceptually and, and philosophically. Uh, and as part of that learning process, we built uh, this canoe with, with our elder, Marcel. This is really one of the highlights of my career. Uh, and we paddled that with the students at the end. And, and I can't cover the teachings involved with the canoe, but um, just to say it's not as simple as building an artifact. Um, and the canoe came a vision to Marcel, it was named Hope. And just for context, uh, he always talked about this vision for 2020. Uh, he knew something big was going to happen in 2020. And this is when the boat was supposed to take its journey down that river and retrace those traditional um, paths. Um, and then, of course, the pandemic hit. And so I'm not sure what that all means, but I think there's something interesting in that Marcel's vision. The only thing that remains of this studio is this artifact named Hope. Uh, this is student work, just as a, as, as a sample of, of this studio of a student named Maeve McDonald, a non-Indigenous student. But it gives you a hint, this is a diagram she did of her project, which the, the design project was a boat building structure. But uh, how we can understand the way we, we engage with the world through language. Uh, this is Anishinaabemowin, uh, which is the language of that site in Ottawa. And I'm not going to go into any detail now, but it gives you an idea of the kind of phonetics uh, and, and, the, and the structures of the words and how they literally weave one into their being uh, in a spiritual sense. Um, and this is a key component uh, for me as language. And just another example of one of our Indigenous students who did this as part of her thesis with me. Uh, she drew this drawing, uh, TPS Medicine, and she was inspired by Scarpa. But I, for me, she took it to another level that I think is powerful. Um, so she's studying the kind of performance of the TPN related to building, you know, building sections. But you'll notice that in, in this drawing, there's a lot of words that she scanned and put in here. And, and the first time I saw it, I said, what, what are all the, the markings in there? And what she did is she, she took her mom's recipes uh, and, and her elders' words uh, as they were talking about her project, and she put them into this drawing. And I, I, I think for me, this is a surrender of authorship that seems very indigenous to me, this idea that let's get rid of the, 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 uh, the celebration of the individual. And, and also, I, I call it an intergenerational drawing, maybe the first one I've ever seen in architecture where one's elder and the youth are engaging in a drawing together to explore architectural thinking. So intergenerational um, uh, authorship is quite interesting, I think. Um, and uh, some of you may know, we, we were in the Venice Biennale and, and I, I initiated this group to express some of this stuff. And really the, the, the exhibit that we did in Venice was to emphasize that design of objects can are inextricably connected to landscape, to language, to the songs, to the teachings of the people. Uh, and, and so we had no artifacts there. This was architecture as storytelling because storytelling gets to the heart of indigenous peoples and, and is a continuation of, of the voices. Uh, and I've got a story I can share late, later or now. It depends on how we do for time, but um, uh, about this, so I can return that. I think we can stop here for now and just start the conversation unless you guys want to hear the, the story now. I think it'd be great to hear about the story, <laughs> personally. Okay. Yeah. David. Okay. Uh, yeah, I guess the, the reason why, you know, people, I guess, uh, to continue, I just don't want to take up all, all the space here, but many people over the years uh, have uh, have struggled with a similar question, I think, that, that Bruce is and Sanford are asking today. And so uh, I'll tell you what this is called, what grounds you. 
when my when my uh, when my graduate studio first engaged with, I gave them a lot of readings about cultural appropriation. Uh, in Canada, we're very aware of, of of indigenous knowledge and the sensitivities around it. Today, we are still mourning, uh, as many of you may know, of, of the discovery of of literally over a thousand uh, buried children at our residential schools. Um, and so, this this is uh, not a light topic. And to ask a a twenty year old, twenty two year old. Uh, to work with indigenous community and design something with them uh, that can be quite intimidating. And, and I found in the first couple of weeks, uh, my students were kind of frozen. They, they, they didn't know what to do. They, they, they felt out of place. They didn't know if they were welcome. They didn't know even want to sketch. So one of our elders, a wonderful man named Jerry Ottawajawan uh, at our school, uh, I would also just say we're the only school in the world we think that have uh, elders in our studios uh, permanently uh, to advise our students and our faculty. Anyways, Jerry walked up to them and one after one, he kept going to them and he kept asking them this same question. He said, well, what grounds you? Because if you don't know who you are and what grounds you in the world, you're, you, can't, you can't move into this space. And, and, and that froze them. They, they, for a while, they didn't know what to do. And anyways, we ended up in this conversation about this. And... As we were with the community, there was this uh, a, a man there, uh, you know, he's probably, you know, my age, not, not old, not, not, not young, but uh, he told this story that really impacted me and I've shared it numerous times and, and I just wanted to share it with you. And he talked about how he, as a young man, as one of their rituals, they go into the forest uh, for no, numerous days um, and they, uh, they hunt and, uh, and they're by themselves for the first time. And so there's this kind of rite of passage. And so he was up on his hunting uh, uh, platform. Uh, it's kind of raised off the ground in the trees. And he, he said he was sleeping. And the, the sun, the, you know, he woke up, it was sunny, and then he heard something fluttering beside him. And, and he looked down and there was a, a hummingbird. And, uh, and it was broken and it had a broken wing. And so he, he lifted up the hummingbird and, and put it back on his platform. And then he went to go home. And, and then he looked back and he, he said, I couldn't, I couldn't leave the hummingbird. So he packed up the hummingbird with him and, and took the hummingbird home and patched up its wing as you would with popsicle sticks and, and other things. I don't know exactly what he did. And he fed it sugar water and, and, and brought this thing kind of back. And, uh, and after about, I don't know, let's say a week, uh, the hummingbird started flying around his, his house again and was back to life. And he said, so he opened up the door and the, and the hummingbird blasted out of there. And then it turned around and it came back to him standing in the door and it, it paused right in front of its face, his face for like a split second. You know how they do that. And it, and it kind of gave him an eye to eye and then bang, it was gone. And he said he just felt like he came back to say thank you. So uh, it had deep impact to him. So he didn't get the hunt. He didn't get the kill he was supposed to in his rite of passage, but he got this hummingbird relationship. So. The story goes later on that, uh, you know, a decade later or so, he was with his first child. And for the Ojibwe people, uh, they are given uh, a traditional name, uh, not, not just their English name. And that's a gift from an elder. So uh, the, at a ceremony, the naming ceremony, the elder that was, was naming his daughter uh, was sitting with the daughter, as they do for some time. I don't know if, you know, if it was an hour or whatever, spending time with his daughter. And, uh, and, and she kept laughing at the, at the child. She kept laughing and laughing. And then finally he went over and he said, you know, you're, you keep laughing with my daughter, you know, <laughs> what's so funny about her? And she said, you know, this little one has a sense of humor. She says, uh, she says she's known you before. Her name is Hummingbird in their language. And he bawled. He said he, he, he just started crying because no one knew about that story of that Hummingbird before that moment. Um, and what he said to uh, the class was, he said, this is our relationship with the natural world. He said, when we hear crows, we don't hear birds making noise. When, we, when we're in the bushes and the wind is moving and the water's moving, uh, those things mean things to us. We, are, we feel tied to them. And, 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 and that really had deep impact because sometimes people say, well, you know, how do we get into indigenous thinking and, and doing things? And how do we, we choose this path? And 
and all I can say, you know, is, is that it's, it's, it's a very slow process. This is a lifetime of generational knowledge that is passed on to the point that it's not something you think about. So as another example with, with Batchawana, you know, and one of our food, we were sharing food with them as a feast. And, um, and I could see them preparing a plate. And then they told me after that every time they have a community feast, someone drives down to the water and offers food into the water. They never have a community ceremony without giving food to the water and they say a prayer and they thank the mother earth uh, for their sustenance. Uh, that's, that's where it becomes uh, not something you think about. That's part of who you are as a person and your relationship to the world. So I, I, I share those stories with you because uh, they're powerful uh, in, in the way that we think about ourselves and our relationship with our living uh, environment. So um, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll I'll end and, and hopefully that helps spark some conversation. So thank you, Marcy. Thank you, David. That was really very beautiful, very beautiful. We have hummingbirds here in uh, in California. Beautiful, beautiful. I, I, you know, I've been, uh, I've had my thing on, on mute. I've, I've been talking and thinking, but anyway, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Um, we certainly do have plenty now to carry us through the hour and a half. I just want to be, just want to make sure I want to touch base with Sean, make sure he's there. Water may become a topic uh, of metaphysical speculation today. I want to make sure he's uh, paying attention. Uh, Bruce. Yes. What are your thoughts? You want to you want to uh, sure. present something? Yeah, I have a couple of thoughts that I would like to share. Um, first of all, I want to say that um, I am joining us from the ancestral homelands of the Council of Three Fires, the Ojibwa, the Ottawa, and the Potawatomi. Um, <clears throat> um, I grew up where David works. I grew up in on a farm uh, outside of uh, Wanapate, um, and you notice that David pronounces that differently than we did uh, back then. Um, uh, we had the last farm on the road, which was uh, five miles into the forest, um, and um, our house was built on a kind of rocky hill, which meant that we didn't have running water during the winter time. Um, and my job as a young man was to go to the well in the valley with my snowmobile uh, and provide water to the house. Um, and frankly, growing up, I was embarrassed by that. I didn't really talk about it. I didn't think of it as part of my, uh, a, a part of the life that I wanted to have. And um, I, but I, I didn't go to a city until I went to college. The first time I left uh, the North was to go to art college in Toronto. Um, and I began working as a canoeing instructor in Algonquin Park near, the, near where I grew up. And, um, and I noticed something that was very perplexing to me. Even back then I was in, you know, I was in college and uh, I, I noticed that when we went into the park, we behaved like citizens. You know, we, we respected the land, we respected the environment. We took out what we brought in, we left it as we found it. Um, and it was an awesome experience, an awesome place. Uh, but the moment we left, all bets were off. Um, we, could, we could trash anything and everything, and we did. I mean, the moment you leave the park, you're, you're back in the way we live today. And, um, and what I realized was that we had this kind of island of intelligence you know, that in the park you were intelligent and the moment you left, uh, it was a sea of stupidity. And, um, you know, we just uh, could, could do anything. Um, uh, I became a designer, you know, quite by accident. I didn't really <laughs> understand what that was. Wasn't a lot of talk about design on the farm. Um, but I, I fell in love with, with ideas and images um, and that became my, my practice. Um, and, um, I did a project eventually called um, Massive Change, which was about the, um, you know, the design of the way that we live. And it was based on a 
beautiful quotation by Arnold Toynbee. And Toynbee was a British historian who wrote a 20 volume history of the world. And he said that in the long sweep of history, the 20th century would not be remembered either for uh, conflict and violence or for technology and innovation. Um, and this was in 1957, which was, you know, he, he would have lived through the worst killing in human history uh, and the explosion of innovation that, that produced it. Um, but he said, no, that's not the big idea. The big idea is that it will be remembered as an era in which we dare to imagine the welfare of the whole human race as a practical objective. And when I read that, I thought, well, that's the biggest idea I've ever heard. Um, I think that's true. I think that's why I'm a designer. Uh, I think most designers are designers for that reason. We probably wouldn't frame it in that grand way. Uh, we don't quite see that big picture, but we are contributing in our own way uh, to try to do that. Um, uh, I, when the project opened in uh, Vancouver, it was an exhibition that went from Vancouver, Toronto, and Chicago. Um, when it opened in Vancouver, I had an event at a high school and um, I showed the project and talked a little bit about my experience and Toynbee. And, um, and after my presentation, a young woman came to the microphone and said, Mr. Mao, I think you're not thinking big enough. Um, and I said, yeah, tell me more because people aren't saying that about me right now. <laughs> it's quite the opposite. Uh, and, uh, the, and she said, um, well, Toynbee was right about the 20th century, that it was about um, you know, the whole human race, but the 21st century has to be about all of life. Uh, take out you know, the whole human race and put in all of life, that that's the welfare of all of life is really what our project is. And I have to say, I was just totally blown away that by this young woman and um, it began a kind of process and a, a kind of journey uh, to what we call life-centered design and ultimately to MC24, the, you know, the book that we just published on the principles of life-centered design. And along the way, uh, I met um, a man named Terrence Galvin who runs the school uh, that David is part of and, and David and the people there and they asked me to join their advisory board. Uh, and through that process, I met um, uh, indigenous elders and began to really understand what they're doing and um, how important it is. And I think you just saw how important it is. Um, and it, um, that really inspired me uh, to learn more and to really understand. And what I realized was that they had they are working from the destination that I was searching for. That I was looking for uh, a, a cosmology that is not about us. Uh, and Sanford really clarified that idea that it's not about us, uh, that design is not about us. It's really about all of life. And um, in their cosmology, they don't put humans at the center, they put um, they put life at the center. Um, and we had an extraordinary um, experience. Um, you know, I was working on a project in, in Panama City, the world's first museum of biodiversity. And I was developing the, the content and the experience design uh, with Frank Gehry doing the building. And uh, we went into the jungle with E.O. Wilson. We brought Wilson down to uh, Panama to, to get his input on our project. And uh, we went into the jungle with him, and it was one of the most incredible experiences I've ever had. And he explained that there's only one thing on the planet, it's life. Uh, and life has an experiment going with form. And we are one of those forms. Uh, nothing more, nothing less. We don't have special status. Uh, and when I talked to David and, and, uh, uh, and his friend uh, here in, in, in uh, near Chicago, um, they explained that they think that they are related to the rocks and the grasses and the plants and animals, that we have a kind of relation and it's, uh, we are not separate from them. And in fact, that's one of the MC24 principles that we're not separate from or above nature. So, um, so that's what I wanted to uh, add. And I wanted to, to kind of close with one um, news item. And that is that the independent expert panel for the legal definition of ecocide 
yesterday published uh, that definition. Uh, and this is um, bringing a new statute to the um, inter International Criminal Court. Uh, and uh, this is what they published. Uh, for the purposes of this state, stat of this statute, ecocide means unlawful or wanton acts committed with knowledge that there is substantial likelihood of severe and either widespread or long-term damage to the environment being caused by those acts. Um, I can't imagine not indicting our cities and the way that we build them under this statute. Um, I hadn't heard of that myself. This is uh, Quinter Call speaking. I hadn't heard that that, uh, that that definition and that formalization, legal formalization had taken place. Um, it's fascinating because we're reading a lot about what the guidance to the juries on some of the um, big um, murder uh, cases that are being followed by the press these days have. And uh, they follow very closely on the idea of, um, of, uh, of awareness uh, and uh, in the act. Um, I would like to very brief, I'm not going to, I'm not going to make a presentation. I have a million questions already and provocations. I want to ask whether Sean Connolly, uh, with whom I've been having quite a number of conversations over the last, whatever, 50 days, uh, and who has brought many texts and ideas to my attention and, and, and taught me quite a lot, who's been working on this stuff for at least probably about a decade now. Um, and I'm just wondering if he wants to say anything now or hold off because I do have some questions for him. And to remind the audience, um, we're talking about uh, someone with uh, whose study is in a, in a different context and yet not so dissimilar. Or I'd be interested simply to hear what the thoughts, what his thoughts are on that, which is to say the the Hawaiian um, um, indigenous and ultimately, I would say, metaphysical and economic tradition. Uh, if you have anything now, fine. If not, don't worry. We'll take a couple of minutes and I'll introduce some provocation. Actually, let me do that right now. We don't have a lot of time. I'd like to say something. When Sean started doing some of this work, when he was a student uh, at the GSD where I was teaching, um, uh, he wrote a beautiful paper for me, which I realized was a groundbreaking paper, uh, the kind I uh, didn't expect to see, especially in such a uh, traditional type architecture school. I encouraged him to proceed uh, and invest deeply in the insights that he was beginning to, um, uh, to bring to the surface at that time. But I was particularly struck by the fact that he had access to some of the words, some of the language of the Hawaiian culture in which uh, certainly a deep aspect of the embeddedness of the metaphysical um, uh, principles um, could at least be touched if not absolutely grasped. Now, I wanna pick up on something that David said, which I'm sure was not lost on Sean, and that was the critical component that uh, is discoverable in language in the uses of language, in the way in which language, and I'm gonna use a term now of Erin Manning, uh, or at least one that she uses, it comes from elsewhere, which has to do with the concept of what she, what is known as chunking, which is to say the ways in which one divides up, articulates, breaks up, and also holds together portions of the environment as intimately related. That's to say that every mind, every nervous system, every cultural tradition, and on and on at every scale, um, cuts up the environment, cuts up the world in very specific ways. It does this not only in its language, but also in its perceptual practices, and also in its knowledge systems. So it is very important 
that we begin to see these. And it is true that in the West, because of the way in which we study and even construe the object of study of design, architecture, et cetera, we have really lost. And I think that one of the simplest ways to bring it back is also to begin to look at this problem, this chunking problem, and to engage the issues uh, and the places of learning which we will just right now say is language. So, I mean, you know, Sean, seven or eight years ago, remembered some of my, uh, some of my curiosities and some of my entreaties. And he sent me a book, I guess when he found it or whatever, he sent me a book of, um, of terms and definitions from the Hawaiian culture, which I just was astonished that somebody even put a book together like that. And I said, oh my God, we can access the treasure. That's my, I'm, I'm, I'm throwing this now up to all of you, all three of you right now. And then ultimately also the all five and six who are participating in this. But I give Sean an invitation to speak first if he's ready. Thank you so much, Sanford. Um, that is so generous of you. Um, it's it's a pleasure and honor to be here. Um, um, I, I re, you know, Hawaii is, Hawaii is the most remote landmass on Earth, um, surrounded by an ocean larger than all the continents combined. Um, and I think there's a lot to be said that um, about our world today where, you know, um, as somebody who's born and raised in Hawaii, um, I remember the first time I, um, um, the architecture really sort of became um, um, a, a possibility of creating a new world for me was when I, you know, um, um, discovered zone books um, in in school in Honolulu, um, and I never would have imagined um, back then in 2003, 2004, um, that I'd be here with you folks today. So um, thank you so much. Um, there's there's a lot to be said. I think um, um, the one the first uh, thing that I would like to um, um, sort of uh, mention is you know since we're we are here around the topic of indigenous. Um, um, our, you know, ancestors are very important. And for me, um, um, I, I don't go around saying that I'm indigenous, but I understand um, that my my lineage and my heritage um, is indigenous to Oceania and the Pacific. Um, and that has to do with my, my grandparents. Um, and so I just wanted to first, um, you know, um, acknowledge my my grandparents, um, particularly my grandmother, who was Pacific Islander American. Um, she raised our family in Honolulu, um, worked at a popular hotel in Waikiki before I was born. Um, but only after she died did I learn about my family's story of diaspora and survival. Um, she was abandoned at birth and adopted um, in what, you know, at that point um, was the Philippines. Um, and at age six during World War II, she witnessed the massacre of her, her village. Um, and my auntie told me that when um, my grandmother finally relocated to Honolulu, um, she was afraid of people because of her experience growing up. Um, but she was really smart and that she overcame um, that trauma um, and she learned to love her life. Um, and so my grandmother, who I you know um, consider being indigenous to what became called the Pacific Ocean, um, her story is not just about being a, a hotel housekeeper in Waikiki, but um, her story is one of triumph, um, a triumph of family and peace. Um, um, so yeah, I, 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 I bring that acknowledgement with me um, wherever I go. Um, that's, my, that's my connection to, to um, um, where, I'm, where I'm from ultimately, um, as, a, as ultimately a product of diaspora. Um, in terms of the product being a product of diaspora, um, the second thing I want to sort of offer um, here today, which is something that um, I believe uh, uh, Sanford and Bruce have have seen before. Um, if I'm going to I'm just going to share my screen real quick. Um, this is for um, the audience who, you know, um, um, let's see. Um, and to give some, you know, um, you know, in terms of um, um, this idea of um, um, uh, what Bruce is mentioning about ecocide um, and why maybe um, focusing on indigenous is um, um, crucial today, um, I think has to do with um, um, finding terminologies for us to understand our relationship um, 
um, to settler colonialism. Um, let's see here. Uh, um, and that understanding that relationship to settler colonialism is um, important for um, um, understanding what what grounds us. Um, one moment, this video that I that I have, which is um, um, so so important to share, suddenly didn't work. Um, so I'm just going to pull this up very quickly, um, which is right here in my my folder of videos. Okay, Sean, here we go. Is, is there any yeah. background sound in that? Because it might get us blocked if it's uh, for copyright reasons. Oh, no, there's no there's no background sound. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so here um, in this video um, on the lower uh, corner um, is the island of Oahu, um, where I'm from. And I'm just going to take a moment um, to expand um, our land acknowledgement. Um, here, this 3D Rhino model displays a GIS-based near-accurate cumulative mapping of the U.S. militarization of the Hawaiian island of Oahu following the illegal annexation of the Hawaiian kingdom by the United States in 1898. I want to call, I want to use this video to call attention to our current entanglement. 202 years after the departure of the first American missionaries from the United States to the Hawaiian kingdom, we find ourselves amid continuing war, pandemic, and climate change. Um, now we can add the term ecocide here. Um, I want to extend our land acknowledgements to also include acknowledgement of the ocean and sky, which is important for recognition of Pacific Islanders. The ocean is not separate from land, but a continuation of it, as well as the sky. This makes our interaction to today possible. Um, if we can take a moment for quick meditation as you watch this video of the militarization on the screen, I want us all to remember and imagine how big we actually are on this planet. Our broadcast transmits via giant electromagnetic waves, our image and sound hurling hundreds of miles into the sky, into heavens, across horizons, bouncing off the ocean and ionosphere around the planet, into space and back again, towers and cables, undersea, over land, through channels. Anyone who uses GPS or Wi-Fi must understand the vast technological advancements in electronic uh, communications and navigation systems that make our world possible today were pioneered by the United States military from the 1890s to the 1990s at the astronomical expense of Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders who are still paying for the cost of these technologies with our lives. The tourist gaze attached to U.S. urbanism, however, shrouds the perception of the disparities, disparities experienced around Hawaii and the Pacific. Health metrics of U.S. urbanism require to sustain the oceanic scale of technological advancement achieved through the illegal occupation of the Pacific Ocean includes the fact that Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders have the lowest life expectancy compared to any other American. And to quote the, the famous Hanani K. Trask's 1993 speech for the centennial of the Hawaiian Kingdom overthrow, the United States is a death country. It gives death to Native peoples. Um, I could continue on with that, but I do want to get into the conversation. And um, um, if there is one intervention I would like to uh, propose, um, in addition to thinking about um, the concept of islands of intelligence and um, seeds of stupidity, um, um, I also um, see the sea as a source of our intelligence. Um, so thank you so much for for being here, um, for allowing me to be here today. I'm, I'm incredibly humbled. Um, and as the perhaps millennial in the group, um, um, hopefully after this, I can all call you uncles. Um, okay, so thank you. Um, well, what we have, I would like to say, simply based on the con on the presentations, uh, we 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 are beginning in a new place. Uh, I want to call that out to everyone, um, and I want everyone to permit that um, to happen, because it would be great if our conversation did not, shall we say, contract and go back to familiar and very stale places. That's to say, as an exercise, I think it would be great if I can include an acknowledgement that we, it, we stay with it. We try to stay with it. Now, 
Okay, first off, I just want to say one thing to Sean as a way of blasting this open for everyone else, and that is this. You know, if I were to compare what I just saw to what Sean presented 11 years ago at Harvard or whatever that was, I would say that, you know, what we saw 11 years ago was an extraordinary set of drawings and invocations of a hydrological universe. And what we see today, of course, in that, what I'm saying is the image of presentation is actually the image of the colonial um, re, uh, whatever, remapping, reorganizing, whatever that happens to be. And what I would say here is that a, a, a voice is lost uh, in that image. And I would say that this may be a problem of all anti-colonial discourse is the failure in many ways to speak from the indigenous position as other than simply a wounding. In other words, I, does it not always put one into the universe, uh, the universe of the, of the colonizer? And I would have to say your imagery certainly was rife with that. Um, you know, I, I wanna go back to language simply because we haven't talked about it a lot in architecture now in 20 or 30 years. And that is to say, for example, the big question, which I did not understand that David uh, presented, the big question is, what is it that grounds you? But David also pointed out that earth, key, uh, appears twice in the term medicine, key, key. And I would also have to say, I have no idea what key, key means in Hawaiian, but it certainly appears, doesn't it? Uh, now, um, I want to ask if ground and earth and medicine uh, are in fact, if we extrapolate those into broader performative terms, broader design terms, broader metaphysical terms, even broader terms having to do with restoration, healing, which really means becoming one, becoming whole. Um, I'm just wondering whether you, any of you really would like to speculate on this um, because there's one thing that even the West has a right to engage in, and that is the thought of wholeness. And the West and the Anglo West and the scientific West, the technological West has produced extremely sophisticated thought about that question and problem. And we can even find in the Greeks, in our heritage, the sources of remarkable metaphysical insights, which perhaps have, we've simply lost, but which still persist, if you like, in our language. And I guess the last provocation I want to introduce is the very idea of Métis, which had I had more time, I would have researched a little better. It's a term we get from the Greeks. And when the Greeks, it has to do with a certain kind of marriage or engagement of wisdom on one side and cunning on the other. I wish I could go into it in more detail now. I want to remind myself, we did publish books in, at Zone, some of the most important books on the problem of Métis, we did publish uh, at Zone. But, you know, this is a wonderful term. And I want to say the reason I want to bring it up is the idea of a combining of terms, which I have to say, without that, I, I, I would give up my, my vocation. I would give up my, I would have to give up my thinking practice. I would have to give up my hope. Uh, and I have to say, I bring that to the table today. That is why I'm so happy to have David here. I am happy uh, really to have Sean here, Bruce, who in a certain way has already staked a public, um, has taken a public stake in terms of this. I, uh, who am in the process of doing so, many of my friends and some of the colleagues who are online with us today are looking to do so, but it's fraught with uncertain direction. Can I hand this back now to David, Bruce, Marina, Alexandra, everybody, Victoria, specifically I'll, I'll, David, will you bring us, will you bring us sure. the language thing back? Yeah, yeah, no, I'm happy to, to, to answer the, the, this one. 
or started off. Um, you know, I just quickly wanted to respond to the imagery that you mentioned that that Sean produced, and and um, you know, I, it's a what you're you're highlighting is that you know, for instance, I, I wrote a paper years ago. Now I was really interested, and I'm still very interested in indigenous science fiction. Um, and one of the commonalities in many of science fiction novels by indigenous peoples um, is they're very political. Uh, they, they often, uh, uh, the future is about reclaiming sovereignty um, and, and reoccupying. And, uh, and without that kind of truth and reality, you know, it kind of reminds me there's a debate right now in Canada about what to do with the residential schools. Uh, whether whether or not you you wipe them off the the planet and forget they were there, and many indigenous people feel that is absolutely true. Uh, let's move forward, get rid of that. Uh, and yet, I would almost say it's a 50-50 split for many people that say they need to stay there as a reminder to the to the atrocities. Um, and so there's a, an, an inherent voice uh, about the imagery that Sean produced that I think is important to Indigenous people as a reminder, but I, I understand what you're saying about that, that becoming a bit of a barrier uh, for engagement for many people. So I'm, I, I, there's no answer to that one for me. Back to the language question. Uh, I, I really do believe this is critical and the way you, you framed it is, is important. And, and I've been reaching out uh, to some of my colleagues. There's a, a, a really wonderful person named James Bird, who's uh, uh, just starting. He's a mature student. He, he built in construction for many years. Uh, you know, he's a, he's a, he's a mature student. He's probably in his 50s or something. I don't know exactly. But he, uh, he's now doing, he's studying architecture. Uh, and he's a Dene speaker from Northern Alberta. And, uh, and he tells me, you know, I'm not a language speaker. He tells me that when he speaks Dene, he thinks differently. You have to think that you position yourself differently when you're speaking your mother language. And I asked him and, and he sent me a little essay he wrote. And I'm just going to read you this because I think it, in two sentences, he summarizes my whole thoughts on this. He says, the, these Dene morphemes, he calls them, hold in part the sacred entry points into the spiritual world that coexists with our own perceived reality. These simple sounds are the instruments which create the portals to the land spirits, and so must be used if a respectful partnership with the land is to be established. That idea of sounds and words acting as portals to a spiritual engagement with the world is pretty amazing to me. Um, and, and you know, there's, there's a lot of examples of this around here. I, I showed you the slide. Um, and for me, that it's really over the years made me realize the language and the communication. And I mentioned this to you before. I know I talked to a Métis elder in, in a West, um, a good friend of my dad's, Elmer Ghostkeeper. And he was telling me that in, in, in the language there, he's talking about Cree, but there are certain sounds, for instance, that come out that relate to certain animals. Um, and so as you're in conversation, your language will literally tie you into the animals and the land where you are in important ways. And that language is place-based. So if, if, you know, you wouldn't go to Hawaii and speak that language and feel connected to the place because there aren't too many buffalo roaming. Well, I don't know, there could be nowadays. There probably wasn't very, for very many years, buffalo roaming around Oahu. So uh, I really, I believe this. <laughs> and, and I believe that the language revitalization is so critical um, to the future of thinking about how we design. And in fact, James is going to be pursuing a PhD to explore this topic of what the difference is when you design in your language, uh, your indigenous language, as opposed to a kind of abstracted version, a, a transplanted language. I, mean, I think the, the very subject of the sacred, uh, I, I think, is so... Um, it's so central to what we need to do now. You know, Jerry Mander wrote a book called In the Absence of the Sacred, uh, and essentially makes the argument that um, we have built the world, a corporate world, in opposition to the sacred. Um, and when you have no sacred, um, there is no ecocide. You know, when you have no um, oneness, when you have no wholeness, when you have no connection to the world that sustains you, when you fully abstract it and you invent 
a concept like externalities, you know, that somehow there is somewhere to put problems that we, we don't want to deal with. Um, you destroy the, you know, the kind of core experience of life. And I think that, that we've developed very sophisticated design practices that advance that problem. Uh, and it's why we are really, um, you know, working so hard on this, on a new concept of, of life-centered design to really put the sacred back into the world that we occupy uh, and the world that we are part of. And I think um, what I find very exciting is that um, science uh, and indigenous culture are really pointing in the same direction. That you know, we're finally able to apprehend the complexity of wholeness uh, scientifically that is very consistent with an indigenous worldview that really puts us you know in the in the flow of life and you know Sanford and I worked on a book together at zone called incorporations and for me that concept is has become more and more relevant to everything that we do the idea that that the, the discrete object is a fallacy. The idea that you can design a building is, is really a fallacy. That building incorporates life, incorporates the flow of matter and energy, and is itself incorporated into the universe at higher scales. And so the idea that you can kind of think of that building as, and you can, and you can cut off everything that isn't the building uh, that is making it more difficult, challenging, and, and complex um, is, is false. I want, that's so beautiful. My God, you just kind of blew my mind. And I feel like that is an invitation to step up yet even higher uh, from where, uh, from what my first, um, you know, entreaty that we not fall back into routine positions and thoughts and frameworks and I'm going to carry this now back to uh, all of you. And I want to ask, I mean, we don't have in this particular forum any really hardcore, politically hardcore um, activists, shall we say. Um, but I would like those who are connected to them to help us all engage the following question. Um, let's just say in the technological West, a system of thought has emerged in various places and times over the last 70 years and 200 years, etc., in which a more undivided understanding of being and a dynam dynamic understanding of being uh, has emerged. In other words, a break, let's say, or an alternative to the, um, the static um, uh, understanding of the world, which was so important ultimately to, um, to uh, the technological enterprise and the scientific method and the rational rational processes of the organization of life. And uh, there is a very rich tradition and they're very, very deep. I've never met an ecologist who did not have a, if I may use this word, a feeling, a deep feeling for a reality that one could continually deepen, to which one could continually deepen one's approach and one's understanding and one's engagement with, if I can put the preposition at the end. And what I want to say about that is that what we refer today in a certain shorthand way as an indigenous position, I would argue may very well not be as such an indigenous position, but a merely a position that the indigenous cultures have not 
been so radically alienated from as ours, but that it is ours as well. And that I want to understand if you guys, if any of you can answer from the position of the more extreme political, um, let's say those who, pra those who practice at the more extreme fringes of the uh, indigenous, the, the protectionist indigenous uh, mindset, how can we all engage in a way that poses no, I don't know what to say, no offense and no uh, falsification of the cultural assets, shall we say, of the indigenous, um, of the indigenous groups in their, you know, in their multifariousness. Uh, I truly, you know, I, I wanted this conversation to happen because I wanted to publicly establish a foothold for which this problem can be pursued beyond today. I consider it absolutely vital for me. And I think it's vital for those who are gathered with us today. And I hope for others we will engage over time who may have found this to be in, you know, compelling and urgent and important. Now, please, please help us. David, can I invite you to respond? Yeah, I think um, there's a couple of layer, there's many layers to this and I'll try to be a succinct answer to this, to this question. The first thing I think, we're talking about spirituality and land and, and um, this relationship is central to all indigenous people. And, and as Bruce really eloquently described, this is, this is the, the, the path forward that we need to, to revisit. I'm, I'm just currently finishing, it's gonna be in bookstores in a couple of months, uh, an edited volume of Scapegoat with a, a, a professor named Adrian Blackwell, non-indigenous scholar. And we're, we're really teasing out this idea of property. Um, now, I know this sounds very broad, but um, there are many layers to this question of why this is such a difficult one to answer, Sanford, because the, what we are calling the fiction of property is, is huge to Indigenous people. We have created a world where we actually think this is just normal for us to draw a property line on a piece of paper uh, and say that you own that. And if you want to cut down a tree or you know spray pesticides and kill all the insects on your trees, you have ownership. You have the right to do that. Where did that right come from? Well, we've, we've, we've been unpacking over the last couple of years how this happened. <laughs> this idea of property. And I was naive to think that, well, this is a European concept of property that was transplanted into the colonies, but actually that's not how it happened. In fact, land ownership, you know, in a feudal system was very different. And there were different levels of rights and, and ownership uh, in Europe prior to the colonies. In fact, it wasn't until they dispossessed indigenous peoples of their lands that Europe started to understand the development of nation states and, and how to divide property. And then it evolves into this exchange of what land is worth and who sets them. And it becomes more and more abstract to the point that, uh, that one person can accumulate as much land as they want, depending on their level of power. Um, so, you know, at, this is for me, one of the struggles I have to answer your question, even as an indigenous person practicing architecture is, you know, sometimes I think, well, you know, I'm 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 like the the string quartet on Titanic as it's sinking, just designing a nicer little world in this total disaster. Uh, you know, we're arguing whether we should parametrically design or what kind of insulation we can use. Meanwhile, we're we're in a, a deeply flawed relationship to the idea of land and who owns it and who has the rights to occupy it and those sorts of things. So I think like the, there's very many layers to this. Um, so that's one component. And I think that's core to this. So language and land. But the other thing that I think is very important uh, is, and this is the one that I don't understand. And I, you know, I, I like Bruce's comment that science and indigenous teachings come close together and they do. And this is a positive step forward. But I think there's, again, the next step for me uh, from a more kind of radical lens would say that 
you know, we have this issue that everybody's, you know, checkboxing off their lead points and, and you know, carbon footprints diagrams and, and, and feeling really good about that. Um, but we haven't really altered this question of our relationship to the land. So as long as my life goes on as normal, I still own my cool gadgets and my, my car and, and, and everything else around the world functions around, then that's great. But we haven't actually fundamentally changed anything. And for that kind of positioning, I, I just bring up this question of, you know, if language is a spiritual thread between the, the kind of sacredness of the site and the spirit world and, and our agency, uh, then ceremony is the is the act that that threads us into that place. And you know, of the indigenous architects that I've that I've met over the years, uh, you know, many of us are, are you know scrambling on a day to day basis to keep up with emails and everything else. Douglas Cardinal uh, practices ceremony every week. He sweats every week. Uh, he's 88 years old now, um, and, and ceremony is what helps us reconnect with that language and the place. Uh, and so. This question, I, I feel to, to Bruce's earlier point, ceremony is completely non-existent, you know, <laughs> in our world for the, for the most part. And uh, until we kind of reach to that level and take that seriously, I just feel like we're going to still be playing the same games and, and trying to dress things up to look prettier. So um, the, that, that to me is the core. And then, you know, I guess to the final point to your question of how do we engage in a positive way. And for me, it always comes back to what, what things do we share? And, and, and we mentioned it earlier, water. Water is something we can all rally around. Our children, the, the life of children. Um, you know, there's so many topics that we can talk to as humans because all of us, as you said, have indigenous relationships in our heritage all those things we all come from a place in europe it doesn't matter like you said the greeks the romans it's there it's in everybody's roots we all have it inherently in, in us as humans we've just kind of been stripped of it so um those are kind of uh, some responses that's great i i just wanted to um jump in a little bit um, um i heard the term activist and um you know in terms of humility, I tend to not be uh, very vocal about who I am or, or things like that. But first and foremost, I do consider myself an activist. Um, I, uh, you know, did go to Standing Rock in 2016. I formed the nonprofit and sued the city and state of Hawaii um, to stop um, the United States Army Corps from channelizing our streams. Um, um, and, you know, my my uh, venue for my activism. Um, it's been a, it's been a struggle and it's taken me 10 years to sort of, um, commit to that concept of my activism being, um, um, the role of an artist architect with a hyphen, um, trying to sort of, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, language and, and, um, breaking down these sort of, um, distinctions between, let's say, um, the way those distinctions manifest in the separation from like a building and its landscape, um, the separation between human and land, um, um, you know, this is sort of like my sort of way to claim fluidity, um, um, identifying as an artist hyphen architect. Um, but then more specifically, um, trying to describe how I operate um, as an activist, artist, architect, um, I describe myself as a cartographic expert witness geomancer mystic. And so the reason why I, you know, um, uh, the expert witness is, is technically because I am technically an expert witness in architecture in the state of Hawaii, but also because um, I have the capacity to list legal harms. Um, and legal harms are, um, are an important, uh, acknowledging the legal harms are an important part of um, reclaiming um, issues of language and how that language informs our connection to place. Um, I was just watching uh, sort of, you know, Hanani K. Trask is essentially my hero. Um, she's Native Hawaiian um, activist. Um, um, who uh, was very active in the 80s and 90s and, and early 2000s, uh, 70s, 80s, 90s, early 2000s, um, um, was there right alongside the um, sort of um, uh, 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 cultural resurgence, um, the sort of second Hawaiian Renaissance, which really um, comes out of the 1970s in, in Hawaii um, after a series, and you mentioned property, um, after a series of sort of um, evictions um, of these Native Hawaiians who are living in um, Kalama Valley. 
Um, and, you know, the 1970s in, in Hawaii was just like a fantastic time period, um, you know, alongside um, the development of uh, GPS, you also have the sort of revitalization of um, Polynesian voyaging, wayfinding, non-instrument navigation, the, um, um, the sale of um, the inaugural sale of the Hokulea. So there's this whole sort of um, um, uh, revitalization and, you know, um, um, uh, for example, Hawaiian language was essentially suppressed after the United States, um, you know, we're talking about language and the language in Hawaii was actively suppressed following the overthrow in 1893 and the illegal annexation in 1898. And that language wasn't, was eventually made, it's the only indigenous language in the United States that's officially part of uh, a state language. And that didn't happen in, until 1978. And that language wasn't really integrated into uh, like Hawaiian language uh, schools weren't really formalized until the 2000s. And so there's a sort of like generational lag time that happens. And, um, you know, uh, the reason why I'm sort of uh, jumping all over the place is Hanani K. Trask also says that you can't just go and learn the language. Um, you need to be political. Um, 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 language needs to be tied to a land base. Um, and if you don't have that uh, you can't just learn the language and 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 then suddenly magically the land base appears. You have to be political about it, which is, um, you know, uh, my responsibility to uh, uh, start with the sort of acknowledgement of the things that are keeping us from our land base, which is right now the illegal occupation of Hawaii. Um, and um, my guess, uh, uh, since I'm starting to um, unravel myself, I will offer in terms of language in Hawaii, the term for land is aina. But that concept of aina, um, ai, being related to food or eating, and na being a sort of, um, uh, uh, I don't know what you call it in English, but um, um, uh, that which feeds, um, about the systems that feed. Um, and so getting a land base is also about getting, uh, reconnecting to water, um, reconnecting to food systems. Um, um, and that inherently is uh, a, political, a, a political process. And what I'm what, one of the reasons why I was interested in this workshop and this whole series is that we do need, um, you know, um, I remember when I went to Standing Rock, the first thing that we got was like a 2000 page syllabus. Um, and then it started with a, with, a, with a timeline. And that timeline was basically, if you, you've been, basically, um, I was invited to go to Standing Rock, which is why I went. Um, the protocol, um, another term for ceremony is protocol. The protocol is if you weren't invited and you're just going up, you should just donate the money it would cost to go up there to a native person who needs to be there. But I was invited, um, so I, I went. Um, the person who invited me had lived in Hawaii for 10 years. Um, I got to stay in, in one of the yurts and it was a fantastic experience. Um, but what made it important was getting that timeline, which um, was the sort of uh, settler colonial um, timeline of the United States. Um, and and um, um, uh, like, in terms of what grounds us, uh, a question I would I would have to ask is um, what grounds um, what grounds us, but what grounds our language? Um, and if we can reconnect to what grounds our language, I think that um, um, you know uh, it won't be a problem um, eventually for for us to participate um, in um, you know um, Bruce, you mentioned wanting to um, um, go to a, an an indigenous event, um, um, and that you're wow, wow. We're, 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 we're so we're so afraid even to use those terms, but we've been invited to use them, so we'll use okay. them until we get disinvited. Okay, um, um, you know, I as long as you're invited um, and that you you know um, you go with an, an open mind. Um, 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 yeah, we we need more. We need allyship. Um, we need accomplices to to um, um, you know help help take down the systems of uh, uh, oppression. Um, so anyway, I I I don't want to uh, fall back too much or or get um, um, yeah, so. But anyway, thank you for letting me share some of that. <laughs> could, could I just? Could I, oh, sorry, go ahead, man. Yeah, just, just briefly, thank you, Sean and David and Bruce, fantastic contribution. I was just kind of thinking about the first of all, one comment about property. I, I never think we own anything, frankly. I mean, when we die, we can't take it with us. So I always, I always think we we borrow things while we're alive. I'll make that point. But secondly, on the question of language, you know, I think that I mean, 
people, when you ask people what they mean by architecture, they say buildings. But to my mind, architecture is about the discourse of buildings, how we talk about them in some ways. And I just want to say something to the historians out there. I'm sure they're historians. I don't cut myself an historian at all. But in some ways, you know, I think the way that we describe um, it, the, the territorialization, shall we say, uh, is also goes into the, a way in which we describe history. And I was really struck by David's discussion, which echoed in a really beautiful way some of the, the things that Ana Maria Duran Calista had been saying about South America. She's an Ecuadorian um, architect, and she was talking about very similar things, and particularly about kind of trade routes through the Amazon and so on, and, and a very sort of, and what she says basically, that there was an incredibly sophisticated sort of civilization going on in South, South America way before the Europeans started colonizing this, and yet somehow this has kind of been obliterated from our history in some senses, you know. And maybe I'm part and parcel about this because I was I my first book was a translation of Alberti and and somehow history begins with Alberti for many people but of course it doesn't and I was kind of struck in a way by 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 Anna Maria's discourse and, and I was kind of left thinking she made one comment she said basically you know who are the savages you know who are the savages you know and I would ask that question right now uh, in terms of our the colonization of things and it struck me that in some ways as an historian uh, it, those who are historians we almost have an obligation to pick up on some of the the, the ways that I think that that, um, that Walter Benjamin started conceptualizing kind of uh, the history and civilization, he makes this comment: there is there is no discourse of civilization that is not also uh, no there's no there's no act of civilization that's not also an act of barbarism. And he, he talks about the role of the historian that has been almost like his, the, the history that as civilization is like a steamroller that is kind of burying things in its in its kind of pathway, and it's the role of the historian to redeem the buried fragments. Not of the famous people, but those who have been vanquished by history. And it struck me that this kind of thinking is precisely what we should be doing, is in, in a sense redeeming those buried fragments in terms of our histories. And I'm, you know, I really think that one of the real problems we have is a, is a very kind of Eurocentric view of the history of architecture, which which is completely false, you know. And I think we need to kind of deterritorialize that, the discourse itself, and open up to new ways of thinking about how architecture, what it might be in its in its in its basis. So I just want to throw that in there as a kind of comment. If I could pick up on, on that, Sanford, um, you know, just as a, as a snippet, this was what I was going to say, but your, your, your thought made me, we just finished our accreditation and, and we're fairly radical. Uh, I think we're relatively radical. We try not to be as radical, but uh, we, we, this is the, the conversation we have with our accreditation team is the fact that actually, you know, our first course in history is, is sacred places meaning before anybody learns about anything else, they start to understand the history of, of world lands and religion from a sacred perspective. That's their first in, uh, course. Uh, you know, we teach structures. We start with wigwams. We, we start with wigwams and bird nests uh, are our starting point. Uh, but the, the we got flagged for our history because we don't teach canon Renaissance history. Nobody, very few people in our program know anything about Palladio. <laughs> And they're like, well, how can you teach architecture if you, if you don't know the canon? And, we, and what we're trying to position is say, what is a canon? Because there's a canon right here in, in northern Ontario that nobody knows about. And, and what's remarkable, one of the things I want to write an essay, I've started kind of the, the, the thinking on this. Uh, one of the language teachers here, uh, we, we engaged with her for translating things into Anishinaabe Babelman. And so we were doing our new website and I said, well, what's the translation for architecture? And we started this email back and forth where she said, there's nothing. There's no such word in our language. She goes, I, she spent a week racking her head on what it would mean of a profession to design a building. And she said, there's nothing in our language. We would just use the English word for architecture because there's no equivalent. Hmm. And I just thought that's amazing. Actually, that, that, that doesn't exist. She went through, we, we would say a building, every word has a purpose. So if it's a, a building for learning, it would be described as this is a building for learning, or this is a building for this, or there's other actions attached to it, but never just a word of architecture. And I thought, wow, that's pretty amazing. We're teaching something that 300 years ago on this land didn't exist as a concept. That, that's pretty common, though. I mean, for example, in Hawaii, the term ahupua'a, um, which is, uh, you know, uh, the closest sort of general description is a land division. Um, but my colleague Noel Peralto defines it as a unit of um, um, ritual observance. Um, and so like that kind of concept, like the idea of, we talked about um, boundary in Hawaiian, the term for boundary is palena. Um, um, we talk about like the idea of property and boundary and um, um, there are concepts, indigenous concepts um, that uh, for boundaries um, um, and in, in, in a sense property and relationships to property that just don't really exist in the English language. And so it's a, 
Um, yeah, it's really interesting sort of back and forth. And that's one of the reasons why I really do think that theory and philosophy in our field is so important because, you know, um, 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 being able to, to translate, um, not just translate um, between concepts, but to do so artfully um, and meaningfully. Um, um, that's, that's one of the reasons why I, I love this um, work. I'm not a philosopher. I'm, I, I wish I could call myself a theorist, um, but I, I, you know, I went to a public school in, in, the, in the former territory of um, um, Hawaii. And, and so my, my education is clearly lacking. Um, you know, even in school, um, the, it was a very territorial approach where my background is considered Asia Pacific um, architecture. And so we actually, uh, you know, they actively removed um, Western pedagogy from our curriculum, um, which I realized was actually a way to sort of, you know, um, like cut my finger off. Um, so I, I'm missing a middle finger, so to speak. <laughs> I just wanted to to, to uh, invite some some female voices. Fantastic discussion today, really wonderful. Thank you so much. I want to I want to hear Alexandra or or, or Marina or, or uh, Victoria or can I put you on the spot? Sorry, you are putting us on the spot. <laughs> okay, I'll just a couple of minutes since I'm just really. Um, a spectator today and, and really, really grateful for this conversation. But I have to say that when David, by the way, it was a pleasure listening to you. When you ask this question, what grounds me? Something really clicked in me. And I actually realized that something I've been doing for the last years, a couple of years at least, is that I've been trying to ground myself. And, and it's incredible that for you know for someone who is deeply concerned about ecological issues as i am or have gradually become uh it's very difficult it's almost like one feels envious that you have no indigenous culture to connect to and i come from poland and i came to the state seven eight years ago um i lived in london in barcelona then in italy and i feel groundless and and, and that feeling of groundlessness is almost as if you were walking on a plane of glass. It's just, there's something completely impenetrable and something that has no depth, no, no roots can just go through that. And I think that it's a little bit related to the, the fact that you can't be an activist if you're not grounded. And when Sean was talking about activism and I thought it takes, decades to actually become an activist because you really need to care something deeply about something in order to do that. You need to be grounded. So what I've been doing, and I realize this is my process of grounding, is that since I know, you know, uh, Bruce said, dad, you can't do that. I feel sometimes, Alex, you can't do that. You can't go to an indigenous ceremony. You haven't been invited. It's not your world. So I, I kind of decided to jump a step back and and i've been trying to connect myself to the world of plants to the world of kind of those elders that we all share and i really like to think about that world as something that is the, the kind of ground that we botanical ground that we all have and and i feel that if we all deeply really care about it and learn about it it's an opportunity to start finding a common voice that will allow us, the Westerners, I consider myself a Westerner, to, although I come from Eastern Europe, to, to, to somehow access that wisdom that the indigenous cultures have preserved. And one final comment I wanted to make, which is something really funny. Um, I was trying to understand how to actually reconnect to some of that knowledge in my own culture and I realized that not only it's been disconnected or, or taken away from me by communism but also by simply enlightenment and and you know all the, the culture that we that we brought into and and I started and I said what can I read and I bought a book of Polish tales that is written by a famous Polish poet Leśmian who is untranslatable uh, comes from kind of in between the worlds, it's called Young Poland, that goes back to the pagan animism and, and those folk stories that are deeply, you know, rooted in, in those simple stories that were told by our grandmothers, but somehow are not part of the common culture. And I feel 
finally a, a some sort of um, satisfaction that it's it's taking me back to that wisdom of the plants that um, was never part of my culture. So um, I, I think that that's what I would share. And I, I and I think in that sense, when Bruce talks about you know designing for life, and 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 I really truly believe that this is the way even if it sounds naive to some people, this is the way we can actually reconnect all together to things that uh, then maybe we can have the right to talk about, even if we're not indigenous. Mm. That's, that's amazing. That is, um, that is a very, very um, um, vulnerable thing to share. Um, and I, so I very much appreciate that. And that's definitely um, something that, um, um, well, in, in our in our courses that we've been teaching, Hoi Nan Linear, um, which I do in collaboration with Dominic Leong, um, our first exercise is our ancestry map. Um, and so we have the students like uh, uh, essentially um, map their ancestry um, and use that as a process to um, generate story. Um, story is a very, uh, um, Linda Tuhi by Smith, who is an a, um, um, indigenous scholar, she has a uh, list of what's called 25 projects. And in the updated version, um, uh, it's there's a, a 20 more projects, um, which are um, considered indigenous projects. And they're essentially uh, curated for um, people who are quote, non-indigenous, which is a complicated term because essentially everybody is indigenous somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a matter of, um, you know, uh, one thing that co connects us all um, to a certain extent is our sort of common diaspora and the ways in which that, you know, um, um, someone in, in, in the Pacific um, might be just as disconnected to the stories of their place as somebody in Poland. Um, and, and this sort of struggle of like, yeah, reclaiming ground, um, how to, how to um, 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 you know, be essentially landless. Um, but we also have our ocean and sky um, um, to remember. And um, um, yeah, as long as I, I think what you're doing is beautiful, um, Alex. <laughs> Thank you. By the way, Sean. I, I think that more people should follow. Thank you, Sean. I, I want to recognize Sean's help in a design studio I've just taught in Hawaii. And the only reason I found courage to do that, to, to work on a plant-based project in Hawaii was because Sean was my guide and, and um, my indigenous voice. So thanks, Sean. May I um, be the egghead theorist for one more second? I love the way a certain generation uh, is terrified of letting the term theorist be connected to them. It's, it's yeah, maybe the height of both respect and modesty because in the end, you will have this branded on your, on your skin in no time, both of you. Um, and we'll talk about that another time, but I would like to just speculate a little further on what I just heard. But to bring it, to, so to speak, to bring it home for uh, multiple engagements by others, and that is this, that um, the concept of ground, which obviously, hit many of us uh, very powerfully the minute it was mentioned um, by David. Um, and because it connects to so much and it connects to things which are so rarely actually connect at levels that are so rarely actually connected in the discourses that we have been educated to uh, sustain as design discourses. And I'd like to say that um, uh, earlier on, I tried to ask whether or not earth key uh, and language um, could be understood as, um, uh, as a circle of mutual implication. And I'd like to say that this concept of ground as just, as just um, and medicine for sure, uh, that Alexandra invoked uh, and repeated in many ways, um, we could say that when the question of what grounds you, the question actually says also, and I'm going to elaborate on this, what heals you? And what heals you generally means in the parlance, which is actually emerging today rapidly, is what restores you? What 
completes you. That's to say what um, returns you and what is returned to you. Now, this is a question that must become central and actually it already is, but for failure, for lack of articulation of that relation, which is what we all need to work on actually, is to develop this language, but it's also a practical language as you all do. It's a design language, et cetera. What returns you? Now, I want to invoke two things. Number one, Alexandra invokes this concept of homelessness. Uh, in my own studies, there was the great, great, brilliant, brilliant theorist, probably the greatest uh, Marxist in my view, was Georgi Lukács. And um, in his pre-Hegelian um, period, he, 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 in, he described the process of modernization Western modernization or the modernization of, of, of life um, as having produced what he described as a homelessness, um, a perpetual homelessness, which was really how he articulated the, the problematic of, of, of the modern. And um, it, what, it, it's a very deep thing. It's in his, un, it's in his, un, his, it's in his short and beautiful essay on the theory of the novel, but the novel he talks about is the art form of homelessness, but it's also where we come to understand what it means to be, shall we say, returned. Now, there's another theorist who had a very simple idea, and that is, uh, um, I just forgot his first name, uh, Winnicott, the British psychoanalyst, who wrote some of the most beautiful things on play. And in play, he said a couple of things, and I'll get to it. The first thing to know about play is that for him, it is the place you go to in order to establish a live communication and relation between reality and what is made up. And what he argues is that this is home. Unless you can establish a living and active reality between what is made up and what exists and is found in the world, that's to say, unless you can participate in a transformation of what is around you and a transformation of oneself in that same act, which is really how I've always understood to be design, shall we say. Then he says, what is play? He says, it is the place you go to in order to relax. I wanted to throw this out to all of you because I think that what that means is, why do you relax? What does that mean to be relaxed? And I think that this is where I see the beauty in the Métis. And I think that it is something we need to develop as an ethos accessible to all of us, uh, which is the place where things, where we discover the active relation and the place that is home. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you, Sanford. I um, actually wanted to, I mean, it kind of fits to that point, but I also wanted to respond to Alexandra because in that kind of relationship, we are very similar. I'm also not grounded in that way, but for me, you know, as a, as a means of self-education and kind of finding that groundedness I've been reading uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer, who uh, is uh, indigenous um, from the Great Lakes, and she's speaking very beautifully in her book, uh, Braiding Sweetgrass, about the intertwining of stories. And um, I think that is a beautiful image of, she talks about the Sky Woman and Eve, you know, the, the different um, stories that we've told um, different communities coming together. And I think it's beautiful because every braid, if you think about a braid, is different and the touching points will be very different. 
And uh, so you have these different lines of stories, but the overlapping will be very different in every individual. And I think that granularity is, is super important and, and very interesting. And I think that is kind of, um, you know, how I see my groundedness because I'm discovering all these stories and uh, I've been reading a lot of Whitehead. And so I think for me, that has kind of grounded me more even in the process that we are all in, because if we think about it, there's this interesting uh, image of the supernova that explodes and kind of uh, releases iron into the atmosphere that becomes part of our hemoglobin and becomes our blood, becomes our life source. So we are actually at the edge, if you think about it, at the edge of that supernova, we are all in that together and we are still in that process. So I think that is what grounds me. And I think that's where I kind of see the connection to even more than just um, other life to our planet and the stories that we tell together. So um, yeah, I think that's that's kind of um, how I see my groundedness and it doesn't have to be, you know, only the human, you know, there's the more than human and even matter and mind kind of intertwined. So um, I think that's, yeah, I want to contribute that. Thank well, you. I would like to applaud. I would like to scream bravissima and clap my hands and scream. <laughs> Uh, first off, I want to say, if you don't mind me doing this, uh, you are a millennial, and I feel un, um, un um, chastised uh, in terms of what it is we can and cannot do. Uh, so I feel like you're saying to us, yes, you can. <laughs> um, any thoughts? It's I, wonderful, I, frankly, simply to see I mean, I have to say there has, there is a brave, there, there, there is, there, there is a necessary bravery um, in engaging uh, just the way uh, you have and you did as an example. Um, that's all. If I could just sort of share real quick um, a quote um, from Mona Lenny Meyer. Um, who wrote an essay called uh, Holographic Epistemologies. And when I talked to her about the essay, um, um, she, she actively replaced the term indigenous with holographic. Um, and um, she closes the essay by saying, indigenous worldviews will thus survive. Tides come in and they go out again. Nouns have always been verbs. It has been like this for a long time. The big three exist. See the science in it, think it through carefully, and then inspire the world with the quality of your participation. Um, Please, most of all, ulu kalea lea, create joy in the process. Um, so yeah, uh, um, the quality of our participation and um, joining the process is um, um, what I'm feeling today. Thank you. I cannot thank you enough for reminding us of that holographic idea. All I can say is uh, that is salvific. That is that is critical. If nothing else happened today, that is a beautiful thing to put into circulation. If I could, just, just my final, I think that was really lovely what Victoria just described, and that is a great book, and it's a great metaphor, the, the braiding sweetgrass. And um, just to bring it back to the powwow for a concluding thought, you know, the answer to Bruce's question and, and his daughter's, and, um, you know, just to make sure everybody's clear at a very basic level that there's a very big difference between ceremony and powwows for, for at least many of the indigenous cultures in, in, on Turtle Island, uh, in, in that uh, a powwow is often a public event, and you'll see posters, and it's public welcome, and I just wanted to share that, you know, if you haven't visited one, there's always a dance, it's called the friendship dance, where they invite everybody down, and you hold hands with each other, and you go around in the circle to the drums, uh, and that is symbolic of exactly what uh, Victoria was just mentioning, that the strength is the people, if you're there, is an individual grounded in who you are and where you're from and holding hands together. There's great strength in that as a group of people. Um, you know, it's very different than, for instance, the impression that we see of, of Germans, for instance, having powwows in Germany uh, with no indigenous people there. I, I've mentioned this to you before, this idea of nothing about us without us. The actual appropriation of indigeneity is inappropriate, but the idea of people being grounded in who they are and coming together with a common belief and a common step forward. There's no, I've not once ever met an elder who gave a teaching that didn't say this teaching is for everyone. It's not just for our people. The teachings are for everyone. It's just how you access them in the right way and respecting each other's cultures is the path forward. Oh, so thank you again for the opportunity. 
Thanks. Thank you, David. Thank, Thank you. you, David. Go ahead, Sanford. That's perfect. Thank you, everyone. We'll do it again. We've got to do it again. We scrape the surface. I'm sorry to intervene with something technical here, but we can stay on the Zoom. I just have to uh, stop the live stream. So um, thank you, everyone, uh, I just, for the just, beautiful just, contribution. I'm just going to stop the live stream, uh, live stream, but we can stay on. Victoria, just before you stop the live stream, can I just say that all these yes. will be uploaded onto the website? And tomorrow we have Sofia Crespo and uh, Lev Manovich. Um, uh, with the thing you're blowing my mind something completely different but also kind of connected in a strange way thank you and so maybe to bring it back bruce please finish your thought <laughs>